This video does not attempt to review the scriptures, other than the Ten Commandments themselves, or the research and debate concerning these fundamental commandments. Instead, this video focuses on a non-traditional technique to try to understand the commandments in perhaps a new light and reveal possible loopholes in their generally accepted meanings. This non-traditional technique is the use of logic. Now, I don't claim that using logic will lead to interpretations that are necessarily correct. Logic, however, hopefully will result in interpretations that the viewer will, at least, find thought-provoking. According to tradition, the Ten Commandments were written directly on the stone tablets by the hand of God. Interestingly, the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Church claims that they have the original stone tablets given to Moses. Unfortunately, the Ethiopian Church does not allow anyone to view these tablets. So, regardless of whether the tablets still exist or not, the only knowledge we have of the words that God himself put on the tablets is what has been written down by the hand of man. There are three problems with this written record created by men. The first is that there are several different places in the Bible that give at least somewhat different accounts of the Ten Commandments. The second problem is that there are slightly different interpretations of these accounts. For example, there are at least 110 different English translations of the Bible. Third, regardless of the different interpretations of Scripture, there will be some that claim one interpretation is the correct one, based on divine intervention or inspiration. The problem with divine intervention is that it can be claimed but it can't be proved. Just one example of this involves the attempt in the year 325 by the early Christian church to decide what writings should be part of the official creed of Christianity. It's simply not possible to know for sure if their decisions were truly inspired by God or determined by earthly debate and normal give and take during negotiations. I am the God of thy father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The common interpretation of the first commandment usually includes the concept that there is only one God. However, the commandment doesn't specifically say this. In fact, it leaves a big loophole open for the existence of other gods. God actually says which God he is. He is the God that brought them out of Egypt and the house of bondage. What the first commandment is really saying is that there is one supreme God and man should not worship any other gods. After all, a God can be thought of as any supernatural being. So this definition would include the lesser gods such as angels as well as Satan himself. The second commandment says that no graven images shall be made. It does not say that no images shall be created. Since God points out that he is a jealous God, this suggests that he may want attention focused upon himself. Logically, if an image helps focus attention and worship on the supreme God, then this is good. However, if an image or object is worshipped because it is seen as possessing powers in its own right, or is a representation of a false god, then this is what the commandment means when it uses the term graven image. There are two loopholes in the commandment of not taking the Lord's name in vain. The first is that the commandment specifically identifies that the name of God is not to be taken in vain. Therefore, the word God can be used freely because it is a title and not a personal name. The personal name of God is Yahweh. Secondly, even the personal name of God is only prohibited if it is used in a particular way, that is, if it is used in vain. 
For example, the archaic meaning of the word vain is foolish, silly, or even mocking. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. There are two loopholes in this commandment. On a fundamental level, can it be proved that the Jewish calendar from the time of Moses has been accurately recorded to produce one continuous unbroken series of days? In other words, it's possible that over the last 3,000 plus years, the days of the calendar have gotten out of sequence. If this has occurred, what was the Sabbath over 3,000 years ago may be a different day of the week than it is now. The second loophole involves the prohibition about not doing any work on the Sabbath. For example, would fishing be considered work if you did it for pleasure, but you also made money at the same time? The point is that what is and isn't work depends on a number of variables, including an individual's personal perception and preferences. The commandment to honor your father and mother seems very reasonable, but when you think about it, it has a very logical loophole because sometimes parents don't deserve to be honored. Children sometimes are the victims of terrible abuse at the hands of their parents. According to the commandment, the reason for honoring your parents is so you can live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. In simple terms, this seems to be saying, honor your parents and you will inherit their property. In its original context, this inheritance would be the land of Israel itself. The sentence structure of this commandment is conditional. Basically, if you don't want the inheritance, you are not obligated to honor your parents. Thou shall not kill. This commandment has already been reinterpreted and has achieved widespread acceptance. Using the word kill just didn't make any sense. There are all kinds of killings in the Bible. Some of it is even commanded by God himself. For example, in relation to the conquest of Canaan, God commands Joshua that, quote, you shall not leave a single soul alive, end quote. In fact, God himself kills almost everyone in the world with a great flood. But this was justified because of their sins. So logically, the prohibition is not against killing, it's against unjustified killing. The generally accepted interpretation now is, thou shall not murder. But the application of logic to this line of reasoning demands an additional level of analysis. Exactly what constitutes justified? A modern example would be the war against Western civilization being fought by so-called Islamic extremists. Certainly many people see these attacks as unjustified and the terrorists are clearly murderers. However, from the viewpoint of the other side, they see themselves as holy warriors fighting a completely justified jihad. A similar clash of perspectives occurred in the Middle Ages with the Christian Crusades against the Islamic inhabitants of the Holy Land. As adultery has devastating effects on the family and thus society, it is understandable why this is one of the commandments. According to the dictionary, adultery is voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. The loophole exists with a surprisingly ambiguous definition of the term sexual intercourse. You could say it is the Bill Clinton loophole. Clinton famously said that, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. In the dictionary, sexual relations is synonymous with sexual intercourse. So at first glance, this definition doesn't seem to help Clinton at all. However, the dictionary also has two definitions for sexual intercourse. The first definition is this, heterosexual intercourse involving penetration of the vagina by the penis. So, using just this narrow definition alone, it could be argued that Bill Clinton was actually truthful in his statement. Using this loophole, 
Bill Clinton was not guilty of adultery. The definition of stealing is taking another person's property without permission or legal right. The loophole in this commandment rests with the words legal right. For example, in many cases, Native Americans felt their rights were violated and their land was stolen from them. However, arguments can be made that the process settlers used to obtain the land occupied by Native Americans was legally followed. But what is legal is often a matter of perspective and, most importantly, who has the power. Another good example of the problem of determining ownership is the conflicting land claims between Israelis and Palestinians even today. Another loophole concerning stealing are the occasions when taking something may be illegal, but it could be argued that it was morally justified. For example, if you are starving, isn't stealing bread justified and therefore not prohibited by this commandment? Thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. A large loophole is created because the word neighbor can be defined in several ways. To some, a neighbor is only those in their neighborhood. Or it could be just those that are in their town, or their country, or their ethnic group, etc. We just don't know what the commandment means by the word neighbor. If the commandment was meant to apply to everyone, it would have just said, Thou shall not bear false witness, and not include the qualifying word neighbor. Thou shall not covet. This commandment seems to be prohibiting certain thoughts. For example, to covet could be defined as just wanting something someone else has. However, it should be obvious that the weight of coveting is nowhere near the weight of the other commandments. To covet, therefore, must logically mean something besides mere wanting of something. In fact, if you progressively search the synonyms linked to the word covet, you will finally arrive at what is probably the true intent of this commandment, a prohibition against wickedness, depravity, and sin. The important thing to recognize is that to covet is at one end of this continuum, and depravity is at the other end. They are not the same thing. In fact, what this commandment probably really prohibits is when a thought turns into a rude physical response. For example, when the desire for food becomes extreme, the physical response of drooling occurs. This commandment also has conditional wording. The word neighbor is included, so this commandment also seems to only apply to neighbors and not people considered to be outsiders. idolaters for this you shall drink bitter waters God has set before you this day his laws of life and good and death and evil those who will not live by the law shall die by the law